Let's get this started. And then I'm going to also go live on YouTube. I'm glad you're handling all the tech. It's so nice not to have to think (laughs) about that. Of course. You're just here to teach us about seaweed. I will do everything else. I love it. Hey, everybody. We're starting to get some attendees joining us. Hey, Brandy. What's up, everybody? Thanks for joining us on this lovely Thursday evening to learn about seaweed. Seaweed. There's nothing I'd rather be doing. Um, Hey, oh my gosh, Brandy's saying hi in the chat. Guys, let us know where are you tuning in from? Talk in the chat, say hi. Feel free to drop your questions in the chat. And those of you on YouTube, please do the same. I got two screens, I'm looking back and forth. So YouTubers, I see you. Zoom people, I see you. I am Katie Tilford, Assistant Director of Theodore Payne Foundation. This is Poppy Hour. This is our little happy hour YouTube Zoom show started during the pandemic to socialize and have human contact. And we decided to continue it. Um, Yeah, so we're on this season, which is sponsored by Metropolitan Water District. Shout out to them for sponsoring this, making this possible. And my guest today, I met on a behind the scenes tour, Theodore Payne. And, you know, when two Katie's meet, there's just this energy between us. We're just drawn to each other. So I have with me today, Katie Dobkowski. Uh, Katie is a marine botanist who loves all things photosynthetic. And there, you know, it's not just plants, apparently, there's other photosynthesizers. So we're going to learn about that today. Uh, Just some background on Katie. She did her undergraduate degree in botany at the University of Washington and taught middle school and high school science before pursuing a PhD. But that's not all. Katie has... um, you have, let's see, before you moved to California, you did research on the West Coast at University of Washington's Friday Harbor Labs, and you worked in the intertidal on the coast of Maine. That is a totally different coast. Were you like going back and forth? Or Yes. Okay. You're a very busy person, Katie. Was very busy. Yeah, so, and you're, you love teaching. You just can't stop teaching. Um, and then you also teach at the Seattle Aquarium in the summer as a naturalist helping beach visitors get inspired organisms that live there really get around I feel like I have no excuse now I've never been to Maine that's pretty nice (laughs) so welcome Katie thanks for joining us thanks Metropolitan Water District for sponsoring so appropriate water ocean botany um and so thanks to our visitors for tuning in feel free to ask your questions in the chat we're not going to answer them right away we're going to save them till the end so please don't get frustrated if we're not answering i'm just going to give katie some time to do a presentation first we're going to get through that so please put your questions in the chat and then we'll address them at the end so katie please take it away awesome thank you katie for having me Uh, I'm so excited to be here on Poppy TV and to get to share about one of my favorite topics, which is botany on the beach. And so before we dive in too far, I'm going to say that a lot. I can't help myself as a marine biologist. I I just have to. (laughs) I want to give you a little bit of background, which Katie did a really nice job of kind of starting the process here of who is doing photosynthesis in the ocean. So you probably heard us thrown around the term marine. Marine organisms dwell in or near saltwater and marine photosynthesizers, like you see some pictures of here on this slide, range from tiny, like these diatoms up here that you need a microscope to see, to kelp that are so large that you can see them in aerial photographs. Microalgae are tiny and often referred to with this term phytoplankton. And if you like plants, you'll be glad to recognize that phyto is a prefix that means plant and plankton means drifter or wanderer. 
And planktonic organisms are organisms that even if they can make little movements that might involve something that looks like swimming, they're really at the mercy of the currents because they can't swim well enough to overcome water motion. We also have flowering plants that live in the ocean. And those are in the group angiosperms. One that you might he see here on the coast of California is seagrass or surfgrass, which is philospadix, and also eelgrass, which is genus Zostera. And the cool thing about these seagrasses is that they are flowering plants. They're angiosperms, and their ancestors were found on land before going back into the ocean. And if you look really, really, really carefully during the summer, you can find very understated flowers on seagrasses. And those are largely pollinated by the water, but very recent research has shown that sometimes tiny little organisms, plankton, can animal plankton can help move the pollen around, which is pretty cool because we often think on land about insects as being awesome pollinators, People didn't really know about that happening in the ocean until very recently. So there are pollinators in the ocean, potentially? Indeed, there are. Isn't that <laughs> wild? Like little crustaceans, shrimpies. Oh my gosh. And yeah, it's, it's very new. That's only come up. It's only really been discovered in the past five years ago. Wow. Yeah. But even though those are all super cool marine photosynthesizer, what we're going to talk about mostly today are the macroalgae aka the seaweed. So let's talk a little bit more about names that people have for seaweeds. I like to start it out as a kelp by any other name. And here we have a beautiful example of a brown seaweed, a kelp. This is bull kelp, the best kelp. More about that later. <laughs> but as you've probably already guessed from the couple of minutes I've been talking, photosynthesizers in the ocean can go by a variety of names. Algae is a general term that's used for a broad range of unrelated photosynthesizers from tiny blue-green bacteria, which you saw on the last slide labeled as cyanobacteria, to majestic bulk health, like you see right here. You also might hear the term macroalgae, or sorry, seaweed, which hints at the salty living conditions of uh, photosynthesizers in the ocean. Macroalgae and macrophyte, got the term macro there, which means large, and seaweeds especially are often large, at least large enough to see with the naked eye, often easily noticeable to the casual observer. And while I might sometimes call seaweeds plants, I'm calling them plants in quotes because seaweeds are not technically plants, although many people default to this term. And if you're interested in plants, you're here at Poppy Hour, so I assume that you probably have at least a little bit of interest in plants. And you'll remember that plants generally have three structures that make them a plant. You've got the roots, you've got the stems, and you've got the leaves. Seaweeds do not have these structures. They might have things that look kind of like them, but they serve a different purpose. So many seaweeds, including this beautiful little bull kelp here, have a holdfast that keeps them attached to the bottom of the ocean. And while you might see some vague similarities between this branching haptoroid holdfast and the roots I drew on my plant over here, it's a little bit different because seaweed holdfasts are not used for nutrient uptake only for attachment. Whereas we know roots not only anchor plants in the soil, but also help them get nutrients in water. So even though they look kind of similar, they're not really the same. And we also have something on a kelp or other seaweeds called a stipe, which kind of looks like a stem. But while most plants move substances like water and sugar around their bodies by specialized tissues located throughout the root stems and leaves. Pretty much no seaweeds do that, with the exception of some types of kelp. In general, seaweed make their food via photosynthesis in the part of their body that goes on to use it. And 
even though the blades of a seaweed look somewhat analogous to the leaves on a plant and they're both used predominantly for gathering sunlight for photosynthesis, blades are very much without the transport tissues. Like if you look at a leaf, you see veins, you don't have that in kelp blades. So even though they look kind of similar, they really have different functions. And in general, we don't consider seaweeds plants. Plants, wow. but not plants. Wow. I'm realizing how little I know about seaweed. <laughs> Tell your friends, plants. That is wild. It's, so it's <laughs> kind of like an air plant to Lanzia is how their roots just serve to grapple onto a tree, but not actually to take up root, uh, nutrients. They just and we will up. talk about epiphytes later. Yes. Oh, epiphytes. Okay. Epiphytes are going to come up because somehow I can't get away from them. Yeah. Good that's question. My jam. That's a great observation. Uh, let me try to convince you even a little bit more fully that even though seaweeds are multicellular photosynthesizers that inhabit the oceans, they're not plants and you can generally kind of categorize them into three broad groups based on the color. You've got the green algae, the red algae, and the brown algae. And the reason seaweeds are different colors is due to the accessory pigments that are involved in photosynthesis that allow for the capture of different wavelengths of light. This allows plants or seaweed in the ocean to use light that's available, which is different than light that would be available on land because water is very, very, very good at reflecting, scattering, and absorbing light. And one more piece of evidence that seaweeds are not plants comes from this tree that you see here. You'll notice that red and green algae are located lineage-wise pretty close to the plants that you see here. Brown algae are over here doing their own thing. And if you have questions about that later, we can talk more about how these arose, but suffice to say, pretty far apart on the tree, brown algae are even less planty than red and green algae. And to continue setting the stage a little bit more, I also want to give you a little bit of information about where seaweeds live. Generally, seaweeds come in two flavors. You've got the subtitle seaweeds, which are always underwater, and the intertidal seaweeds, which are sometimes underwater and sometimes exposed to air. Both of these areas can be stressful. And so seaweeds have awesome adaptations that allow them to cope with environmental pressure like drying out, being exposed to sun, and getting eaten by organisms. And I'll try to give you examples of all of these this evening. And just in case you need extra convincing how cool seaweeds are, remember plants and plant-like organisms have to do all of the same things that animals do, like grow, eat, not get eaten, reproduce, etc. But they generally have to do it stuck in one place, just like land plants. Most seaweeds are what we call benthic organisms, which means that they grow attached to something like a rock. That means that most seaweeds you see on a sandy beach didn't necessarily grow there. They just washed up from somewhere with more seaweed-friendly habitat. So if they look kind of sad and raggedy and you're not exactly sure what color that is, they are, that's probably, they're probably not looking their best when they washed up on the sandy shore. And I bet this will come as no surprise to anyone that humans really like to use seaweeds. And I'm guessing that folks out there in the audience might like to eat seaweeds or use products that have seaweed in them, even if you didn't necessarily know that they had seaweed in them. Alginate is a compound that's derived from kelps, those big brown algae, and it's used as a thickening agent in toothpaste, cosmetics, and food. Until cheaper methods were developed, seaweeds were a primary source of iodine, which is added to table salt to prevent goiters. Seaweeds also play an important role in indigenous cultures on both sides of the Pacific Ocean and in Hawaii and have since time immemorial. They're not only a source of food, but also occur in several groups' traditional origin stories. And it is possible to not only eat seaweeds, but to farm them using aquaculture methods like rafts and longlines. 
There are, in fact, seaweed farms in California, including Monterey Bay seaweeds, which farm farms dulse, ogo, and sea lettuce. And they have a cool system where they grow seaweed in flow through tanks on land. And then there's also people who go out and harvest wild, wild seaweed for human consumption. So in California, permitting for aquaculture is a complex multi-year, multi-step process, which might be why there aren't that many companies undertaking it in California yet. There are other states, uh, some of which I've lived in, like Maine, um, some places that I have not lived, like Alaska, that have a little bit more permissive process for aquaculture, and it's starting to really grow for seaweed. Um, but you may have seen in the news or heard that people are exploring the possibility of growing seaweed for carbon sequestration. Uh, it's possible that additional companies and organizations will enter this arena of aquaculture. But the good news for all of us, uh, psycho enthusiasts, is that recreational harvest in California is a lot easier than establishing an aquaculture farm. Um, as long as you are harvesting outside of marine protected areas and state marine parks, the daily bag limit is 10 pounds wet weight of seaweed, which is quite a bit. Uh, you are not, however, allowed to harvest seagrasses or probably the most adorable kelp in the world, the sea palm. I also wanted to take a moment and highlight an amazing phycologist. Uh, a phycologist is someone who studies seaweeds. Uh, it's not a psychologist. That's a little bit different, but I will tell you, I do get emails asking me to submit papers to the Journal of Psychology. That's not the right <laughs> term, psychology. And Dr. Isabella Abbott, or Izzy Abbott, was truly a trailblazer in psychology. Uh, Dr. Abbott was a scholar and educator and truly the expert on Pacific seaweeds, discovering over 200 species in her lifetime. She was also fascinated by ethnobotany or the study of how people use plants and plants from learning about traditional use of seaweed from her mother as a child in Hawaii to writing a seaweed cookbook and also teaching Hawaiian ethnobotany at the University of Hawaii at Manoa after she retired from Stanford. And this book that I've highlighted here for you, The Marine Algae of California or the MAC is still an important reference book about the marine flora of California today. And Dr. Abbott is no longer with us, but her legacy lives on in her teaching and through her students. And I wanted to give you a recipe from her book using one of my favorite seaweeds, but also could be uh, modified to use other seaweeds. And yes, Katie is absolutely right that you can buy <laughs> this book. It's wonderful. Uh, allegedly, Dr. Abbott often brought seaweed cake to potlucks and shared this recipe. That sounds, sounds so pretty good. delicious. Yeah, no, I, that I also know people make seaweed pickles. Um, yeah, yes. there's, there's yeah. a lot of, a lot oh of culinary God. applications. So now that I've given you kind of a broad overview of the joys of marine photosynthesizers, I want to take a little bit of time and show you some seaweeds that you might see out on the beach here in California. So now we'll take a quick trip through California seaweeds to know and love. And the great thing about California seaweeds is that many of them extend with very large ranges all up and down the west coast of North America. So if you went up to say, British Columbia, Canada, and went to Botanical Beach on Vancouver Island, you might be seeing some of these same species because they occur over really broad distances. And I have tried to include range information about where these seaweeds occur so you know where you can go find them in the wild. So let's start out with green seaweeds. Green seaweeds are pretty easy to recognize because they're green. And it'll make more sense in a minute why I'm saying that. But yeah, they're this grassy green color. The only pigment that they've got going on is chlorophyll, that photosynthetic classic. And they come in pretty simple shapes. Generally with green seaweeds, we're talking blades that look kind of leafy. Maybe we'll get into some tufty or ropey individuals, maybe like stringy filamentous. 
that's about it, which makes them pretty easy to recognize. So one of the green seaweeds that you're likely to see out on the beach is the ubiquitous sea lettuce, genus Ulva or Ulvaria. Uh, it looks like a sheet. It looks kind of like lettuce. It is definitely edible, but some species, which are kind of hard to tell apart just by looking, taste better than others. So it's a little bit of a trial and error situation. And I will mention, because people are often curious about this, none of the seaweeds that I'm talking about today would hurt you if they ate, if you ate them. They're not poisonous per se, but some of them definitely taste better than others. And if you decide to make use of your right to go out and collect those 10 pounds of seaweed per day, highly recommend doing it in a place that is as free of urban pollutants as possible, like say not near a sewage outfall. Etc. Not Santa Monica, guys. Not Santa Monica yeah. or Venice, please. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yep. But not a national, not a state park either. Don't yeah. go to. Don't do this at Crystal Cove. Yeah, you gotta you gotta pick your places very carefully. Yeah. I would say go out into the wilderness a little bit further. Cool. Another green seaweed that I always like to show off has a really uh, actually both of these common names are pretty hilarious dead man's fingers or felty fingers. And if you see this out on the beach, you really will feel it's kind of like shaking a dead limp hand. Uh, this is cylindrical in shape. And the cool story about this seaweed is that it's all one giant cell with lots and lots of nuclei. And yeah. you might think, wow, that's kind of hazardous seaweed. You, you live in a very uh, wave tossed environment. W what are you gonna do if something eats? munches a hole in you or you get bashed by a rock. The very cool thing about the seaweed that I think people often do not expect about seaweed is the fact that it has wound repair mechanisms. If it gets a hole in it, it can basically mobilize forces to fill that hole and keep the good stuff from leaking out. And here on the west coast of North America, Codium is a native species, but there is an invasive subspecies found on the east coast of North America. So when I saw this on the coast of Maine, I had to damper my enthusiasm because it doesn't belong there. It was introduced by humans. But here, if you see it, you can give it a firm handshake and feel good about it because it's a native species. And you might be thinking, well, that's not very many green seaweeds. How are we moving on to brown seaweeds already? But uh, two things. One, green seaweeds are a little bit less exciting in terms of structure and shape. Also, kelp are my favorite, so we have to talk about them. And there's, there's a lot of diversity amongst the brown seaweeds. So we are moving on to our next group. And as I mentioned, I was talking about what might be the cutest seaweed ever. No offense, bull kelp, but the sea palm is pretty adorable. Don't harvest it, Aww. but do appreciate it. Uh, it is found in areas with high wave exposure. You can see it nicely demonstrates this characteristic of brown seaweeds, this olive brownie, greeny brownie color. If it comes in the shape of a tiny palm tree, you know there's quite a bit of diversities of shapes happening. And while these little palm trees get to be about, yeah, about a foot tall, 30 centimeters tall, many kelps are much, much, much larger. And they also have really complicated and amazing life histories and how they reproduce. And I'm not gonna go deeply into that tonight, but if people have questions about it, drop it in the chat and I do have a diagram I can show later. But just appreciate the sea palm and how it eases us into the brown seaweeds. One of the first brown seaweeds that you see very, very, very commonly is bladder rack, uh, genus Fucus. And this is a pretty famous resident of the mid intertidal zone. So not super high up on the beach, not super low down on the beach, kind of right in the middle. And it has some of those awesome adaptations to survive drying out and retain water. So if you have ever had the good or bad fortune, depending on the situation, to walk on fucus, bladder rack, you'll know that it's very, very, very slippery due to mucus. I always like to say fucus rhymes with mucus. <laughs> this mucilage or snot is one of the ways that it avoids drying out. It helps it retain water. 
If you look at the ends of the little branches here, you'll see that they have inflated forked tips called receptacles. These are also really good at retaining water. Uh, the little warts on the conceptacles are in fact where reproduction happens, sperm and eggs are produced there. And not only is fucus really good at retaining water and keeping itself from drying out, but if you were an intrepid marine botanist and you lifted up the fucus and looked under it, you would see that other marine photosynthesizers and organisms like snails, urchins, etc., hide under this layer because it helps keep them from drying out too. So we could think about bladder rack as really being a foundation species that structured what else is in the ecosystem. I bet it makes a really good like moisturizing face mask. Yes. And that's a good point. Uh, <laughs> seaweed is found in a lot of beauty products. And really, okay, yeah. that explains why I'm just overcome with the desire to slather oh, yeah. stuff on my face right oh, now. I think I think it would probably be very very soothing. I also have somewhere I did not put it in this talk, but I have found a recipe for sweet and sour fucus, which sounds pretty good, I have to say. So another another culinary winner. Yeah. This next seaweed looks kind of like uh, fucus, but it's a little bit different because it tends to live higher up on the shore and it can get really large. Its body, or sometimes we call seaweed bodies, thalli, can reach up to 60 centimeters long. So that's that's a pretty substantial amount of seaweed. But this is probably not a seaweed that you would want to put in your sweet and sour recipe because this is one of those seaweeds that has chemically active compounds to help deter hungry herbivores that want to consume it. And again, yeah. it would not hurt you if you ate it. It just probably wouldn't taste as good because some of those compounds are kind of peppery or bleachy. Sometimes people like things like that, but it might not be quite as palatable to you or to the snails on the beach. Uh, this next one I included simply because I had not heard this common name before and I really like it. This is elephant oh. snot. <laughs> um, okay, I could see it. Yeah, I, I don't have a lot of real life experience with elephant snot, but I want to believe. Yeah. And this is another species that's found in the mid intertidal, but can also be a little bit lower uh, in the low intertidal or even the very shallow subtidal habitat. Or sometimes it grows on other algae as an epiphyte. And so I mentioned epiphytes earlier. Katie also mentioned epiphytes. I like to define an epiphyte as a photosynthesizer or plant growing on another photosynthesizer without harming it. And so in this case, it's simply using this other seaweed as a place to live and a place to grow. And they both kind of chug along just fine. The really cool story about this, in addition to its name, is that it starts out life as a little solid sack when it's young, but then becomes hollowed out with age. And you might have guessed that this sack-like shape allows for water retention during low tide, which greatly limits the amount that it dries out. So this is another awesome adaptation to being successful in the intertidal zone, which is stressful because sometimes you're underwater, sometimes you're out of the water, and what's a seaweed to do? It's stressful if you're a human even, so I can't imagine being like that big and constantly getting hit by waves. Exactly, I yeah, they it's stressful. It. Yeah, they have firm attachments. And I also sometimes talk about um, seaweeds that have made poor attachment choices and like wind up washed up on the beach because they attach to like a tiny rock or something. Oh, that no. happens too. Not every seaweed makes it. It's tragic. Yeah. I mean, do they choose where to attach or is it just random? Ooh, so that's a great question. Uh, in some, <laughs> case, some cases it's random, yeah. but... The microscopic stages of kelp specifically can swim. That's right. Not a plant, yeah. not an animal. Still has this little swimming phase. And some kinds of kelp have these little propagules or zoospores that can sense cues. So they can either sense kind of like a smell that allows them to settle in a place with 
the members of the same species, so they have someone to reproduce with. Some of them are what's called negatively phototoxic, which means they swim away from the light because they know that they need to be on the bottom of the ocean where there's less light. It's wild. Seaweeds are wild. This is just That's the what the other epiphytes do. They have negative phototropism because they want to mm -hmm. grow towards the shade of a tree that they can climb. Exactly. Wow. It's wild out there when you're stuck in one place. The adaptations are amazing. They really are. I could go on about seaweed adaptations all day long. But we should talk about this next kelp because it also has a cool name and it can help you make a fashion statement. Ooh. This is the feather boa kelp, Egregia. And if you thought those other seaweeds we were talking about were big, I'm just easing you in. Uh, Egregia can grow up to 10 meters long. And the branches have these little fringy blades on them, as well as floats to help it stand upright in the water. And seaweeds exhibit a lot of what's called phenotypic plasticity, which is a fancy word that just means they look different depending on the environment that they're growing in. And so in areas where there's lots and lots of wave activity, Having a really wide blade would be kind of a liability because it's more likely to get ripped off by the waves. So when there's lots of wave activity, egregia will grow blades that are relatively thin and stringy. That helps reduce drag and reduces the chances of their hold pass getting ripped out and them getting transported to places they don't want to be. In areas with lower wave activity, getting pulled out isn't quite as big of a threat, but the way that seaweeds get their nutrients and gas for gas exchange is by water motion. And so in areas with lower wave activity, blades will be wider to create more surface area for gas exchange and nutrient acquisition. And now if you thought Egregia was pretty big at 10 meters long, let me introduce you to really a giant among kelp. This might yeah. be the most, I want to say maybe the most famous West Coast kelp, um, the giant kelp, genus Macrocystis. And you can see this is another Origin. one with a really long range from Alaska all the way down to Baja, California. And not only is it one of the largest algae with complex habitat, many blades, creates homes for other things like fish and vertebrates, sometimes even marine mammals like sea otters. It's also an important source of primary productivity. And in favorable conditions, meaning lots of light, it can grow a half a meter or more in a single day, reaching heights, the depth of the water that it's in, of 150 feet or 50 meters. And these are perennial wow. species that can persist for multiple growing seasons. And so you can think of it kind of like a forest, but in the ocean. Yeah, that's what it feels like to swim through. Mm -hmm, exactly. Is this the kind they have in the dive park at Catalina? Indeed it is. Okay. Yeah. So if you've been diving or snorkeling around Catalina, you have lived the giant kelp life. Uh, mm. It's in consumed in the wild by many invertebrates, including sea urchins, but it's also har harvested for algin, algin, which is one of those thickening agents that can be made from seaweeds. Uh, Full disclosure, one of my good friends grew up in Long Beach, California, and she says this is the only real kelp forest forming species. And I, she says it just to watch me twitch because <laughs> I, I have a lot of love for okay. bull kelp, Nereocystis, which is also a canopy forming habitat species. Yeah. And it is in California. It's just not in Southern California, but if you go up to central California, northward, all the way up to Alaska, including where I work in Friday Harbor in the summer. It is a very important kelp forest former. It does all those same things that Macrocystis giant kelp does. And because this is why I think it's even cooler. It does it all within a single growing season because it's an annual species. It grows up to six centimeters per day to the depth of the water it's growing in, up to 30 meters in stipe length. And it goes through its whole life cycle from little swimmy bits to sperm and eggs to big, beautiful kelp at the surface with reproductive patches all in a single growing season. So 
I like to say it's the best kelp because Macrocystis is a perennial. It has a head start. Bull kelp is really is really the scrappy the scrappy underdog. It's it also looks culturally like little important. Buoys. Yes, it looks and, like little buoys that you see floating on the surface. And that's a big difference from giant kelp. Giant kelp has lots of floats. Bull kelp only has one float that's at the surface to keep all those big beautiful blades up to do photosynthesis. But there is nothing more magical than snorkeling or diving in a bull kelp bed on a sunny day. Wow. We can love all kelp forests is, is my take home message here. Amazing. I'm feeling like we need to plan a field trip now. <laughs> yeah, I am always out to go look for seaweeds and other things. Uh, but here's the thing. Not all seaweeds are good. What? I've been Uh-oh. spending like the last half an hour telling you how wonderful seaweeds <sighs> are. It's really not the seaweeds fault. It's the people's fault. People are the problem. But nevertheless, there are invasive seaweeds and Sargassum muticum is an invasive species all up and down the west coast of North America, including in California. And it was introduced farther north up in Washington state in the 1940s as a byproduct of oyster aquaculture. So this is people bringing in oysters, but you know what, they packed them in to ship them from the other side of the Pacific Ocean? Ooh, seaweed. You know what that seaweed did? really liked it here. And so now it's spread all along the west coast of North America. There's another invasive species of sargassum here in California, um, in addition to muticum. And so it's kind of a bummer because it competes with local species. And it's also just kind of mean as an organism. Uh, The name wireweed suggests that it's sharp and it can feel sharp to the touch because it has little sharp edged leaflets. It has mm-hmm. tiny little floats used in reproduction. It's really, really, really good at breaking apart and growing more of itself. It has a perennial hold fast that comes back every year, unlike something like beautiful bull kelp, which has to start over every year. So not all seaweeds are our friends. And it's a good lesson about what happens when people mess with environments. And yes, I actually just did see this in the chat. Why are we does have tiny little round floats along it that it uses mm-hmm. in reproduction. <sighs> wow. It's just like on land, there's invasive plants everywhere. Exactly. This is kind of like I like the Himalayan blackberry of the ocean. Because mm. it's good at the monoculture thickets. You don't want to touch yeah. it. It doesn't even make anything delicious. And can the wildlife not eat it? Ooh, that's a great question. So generally no because they did not co-evolve with it they don't want to eat it and it has a very unpleasant texture I've done a lot of experiments trying to feed this to crabs and urchins Uh, they just don't really "Mm." want to eat it yeah (laughs) yeah no they're they're not down um and that might be because of the taste it might have different chemical compounds but it also might be because it's a lot harder to handle and they their claws and other apparatus are not very well suited to eating it. And this came, did this come from the East Coast, you said? No, it came from the other side. It came from the Western Pacific Ocean because oh, okay. we brought oysters from there Across to farm the them. And the oysters did a really good job on the West Coast of North America, but unfortunately, mm. uh, so did the invasive seaweed. Dang. But I know that was kind of a sad note to end on. So now let's go talk about some red seaweeds to know to get the magic back. Uh, Red seaweeds are cool because this is the most diverse group of seaweeds in terms of shapes and colors. Anything from pink to nearly black can be categorized as a red seaweed. And it can be everything from looking like paint on a rock to being a beautiful, fluffy, delicious looking seaweed. Um, I always like to say that when you're trying to identify seaweeds into these different groups by color, if it's grass green, it's a green. If it's olive brown, it's a brown. If it's any other color, probably a red. And I'm gonna give you some examples of that. Here is a beautiful red seaweed to know. This is red ogo in the genus Gracilaria. It can vary in color quite a bit from pale red to pinkish, grows to about two and a half feet tall, and it can often grow in dense beds. 
And this is a species that can be pretty successfully farmed to produce auger, a gelatinous substance that's used as a food thickener, but also in biomedical research, etc. And you may have consumed red ogo if you like to eat Hawaiian style pokey. Doesn't it just look delicious? Like, don't you just yeah. want to take a bite of it? Yeah, I think some of that was in that movie, The Menu. Oh. I just <laughs> We have another very beautiful seaweed, uh, gelidium. I don't know if it has a common name. Full disclosure, sometimes when I'm out on the beach, I make up common names. I think I would call this one like flat red ribbon or something. Uh, another excellent mm -hmm. source of auger. It lives in the low intertidal to shallow subtidal. And you'll notice that the color of this one is really different than the last one we looked at. They're both red seaweeds. But this one can be dark purpley red to even kind of blackish in color as you see kind of down here. And so this is just a good, a good example of how different seaweeds can be in color, even if they're kind of sort of related in the same group. I wanted to make sure I included this next one because this is always a fan favorite, mm, nori. Yeah. So if you like to eat sushi, this seaweed is your friend. And the porphyra or pyropia found out on the beaches in California are the same genus as seaweed used for sushi wrappers. But you might be thinking, whoa, 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 the wrapper on my seaweed or on my sushi is not red, it's green. And the reason it's green when it gets to you is because being dried out for storage and consumption breaks down the red pigments that would have given it this kind of brownish red color in the real world and leaves only the green ones intact. However, mm. no matter how delicious it is when it makes it to the land of sushi, uh, it doesn't taste great fresh off the beach. It's very thin, it's very stretchy. You can kind of like pop it in your mouth and just keep chewing. So mm. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that, but it's still a cool representative to look at, look for when you're out on the beach. And I wanted to make sure that I included pink rocks because these are something that you often see in tide pools. This is crustose or encrusting coral and algae, which I like to call CCA for short. And these pink rocks that you see at the beach are actually alive. It looks like paint, but if you look really, really closely, this living thing, this seaweed may be very smooth or bumpy depending on what species it is, which is really hard to identify when you're out in a tide pool. And the reason it's called coralline algae is because it is calcified, has a crunchy cell wall for protection. And research is still pretty ongoing to understand exactly why these seaweeds have protected themselves with so much calcium carbonate. For a long time, people thought it was to avoid getting eaten, but it turns out it might be more subtle than that. And even though there are some consumers that eat it, uh, for example, there are certain species of chitons, those kind of flattened out mollusky snail guys. It's not really a preferred food for most things, although urchins will gnaw it off with their little uh, scraping mouth parts if they run out of other things to eat. And that means, I know we're almost out of time. I have a quick quiz for you. And I know it looks like people are using the chat pretty successfully. So I have a seaweed for you in this picture. I would love okay. it if you could vote with your newfound knowledge of the groups of seaweeds, whether you think this is a red, a brown, or a green. And I'll keep an eye on the chat for a minute to see what folks pick. Okay, we have a couple votes for green. green. Don't be shy. Don't let other people influence you. Is it a trick question? Oh, no, it is not a trick question, but <laughs> okay. I, I kind of <laughs> wish it was. I'm seeing a lot of greens and browns. It is a green or a brown. That's good. It does kind of look like scallions. Probably pretty delicious. If you said brown, you should feel good about it. It does look kind of meaty. You should feel good about yourself because there's one, I guess it is kind of a trick question because does it look green? Yeah, there's one other thing I didn't mention, which is sometimes seaweeds will appear different colors at different points in their life. So this is, if you look at the barnacles in the picture for scale, the barnacles are pretty small barnacles. So this is pretty small 
uh, fucus, bladder rack, and it does look more greenish until you can kind of start to see in the middle here that it's starting to turn brown as it grows. So yeah, I guess it was kind of a trick question. It is technically a brown seaweed. It is a bladder rack or fucus, but if you said green, you still have good observation skills. And with that, I would love to answer any outstanding questions you have okay. about seaweed. I'll put up my life cycle diagram for you to enjoy while mm, I take gorgeous. questions. This was designed by one of my students from Bates College, who's an amazing graphics designer. So thank you to Charlotte. I commissioned her to make it. Beautiful work, Charlotte. Um, so does any seaweed have roots? That That's go in like question. the ground, like the ocean no, floor. No, they don't. Okay. At most, they attach to the substrate of the ocean wow. floor, but they they never go down into it. I'm realizing how much everything I know just comes from SpongeBob. And <laughs> you know, SpongeBob has some good stuff. <laughs> Nothing. I wrong. mean, plankton moves around he's not just getting blown around by the ocean so that's true and that's the thing with plankton they can they can swim but if there's an ocean current they can't fight okay. it okay so they do yeah. have swimmy bits maybe that's why he has such a bad attitude I mean yeah he does have those really angry little eyebrows yeah okay but. so we have some questions by the way people are referring to you as doc katie Aww. and I'm just other katie <laughs> no <laughs> dr katie um people are interested in harvesting seaweed now that they know they have a 10 pound limit yeah 10 um, 10 pound birthright for um, the edible seaweed can mm -hmm. we just pick it off the beach and consume it should we wash it first so you can do that um again if you are in a populated area i wouldn't do that i would try to go somewhere a little bit less uh less uh influenced by humans i i would maybe give it a rinse um I think in a lot of cases, it does taste better if you do something with it, whether that is pickling, sauteing, mm, pickling. drying. Pickling really I, kelp, kelp chips are really popular. If you think about mm. kind of kale chips, but made with yeah. kelp, uh, there's one type <laughs> of trying to remember what genus, but it's definitely a red seaweed that they've been growing in Oregon that when you, when you dry it, it, it tastes like bacon. Cool. Yeah, vegan bacon people, right there. People are also asking about um, if they can compost seaweed. I don't know, Ooh. it might be kind of salty. Yeah, that's a really good question. I. But there's so, kelp fertilizer. There's definitely kelp fertilizer. And I, I think some. if you want to go that route, I would maybe go for more the someone has processed it for you because I know with compost, it's really important to have those favorable carbon to nitrogen ratios. And also, yeah, it's yeah. kind of salty and it's kind of, um, yeah, I'm not sure I would try that on your own. I'm, it's also yeah. hard to break down because mm -hmm. it's it has, hard. yeah, it's kind of hard and it has, uh, it needs, one of the things that I think is really important in compost is having the microbes that can work with it. And I'm not sure yeah. like, the same microbes that are in a garden are going to be as good at breaking mm -hmm. down some of the stuff in in kelp and also it's just very gooey honestly it's so yeah. gooey um that might be my caution but if you try <laughs> it let us know I'm curious yeah, let us know I mean you can always put if you have seaweed in your food scraps that you were going to eat and then didn't eat you know you I think dried seaweed could dried definitely seaweed. get composted no problem fresh seaweed yeah. I, I think I'd proceed with caution so for the foragers, again, is there a rule of thumb? Like if you see a beach and there's people swimming there regularly, don't collect from there. Find one that's not. I would like try to find one. People with, swimming beach. Yeah, it's not even. Yeah, people are kind of dirty. It's really <laughs> the things that I would watch out for is proximity to sewage outfalls. That's actually a huge problem in Seattle. We have. Yeah. Okay. Uh, several of the beaches I go to there have sewage outfalls very close to them. I also get a weird rash after I go diving. Um, I would also look for beaches that uh, don't have a lot of dogs because dog Ooh, waste yeah. on beaches, um, that can also be a disease vector. So toxoplasmosis. Yeah. And yeah. Which, and all that. Yeah. And now That's why you pick up your dog that, poop guys, even on yes, land, pick it very up. Important. Cause you can also make Harbor seal sick and that's sad. That's right. There was like a viral video recently of a harbor mm -hmm. seal that was 
sick. I, it's very I think sad. it's parvo. Something that dogs yeah. get is now being uh, detected in harbor seals and it, it does not, they're not vaccinated against it. So it's not, not going well for them. Yeah. Um, are there any poisonous seaweeds in the wild that are just bad tasting? For our purposes, really more bad tasting. Now, if you were smaller and more uh, less durable, you might have a problem. For example, there is a seaweed right here in California in the genus Desmarestia. That's common name is acid weed. And it has acidic cell sap to uh, deter herbivores. And people say that it is strong enough that if a sea urchin eats it and continues to eat it, it will actually wear away their mouth parts. So again, oh, wow. I think you would take a bite and be like, I don't want to eat that. So it's not, mm -hmm. again, it's not, it's not poisonous per se, but some are definitely taste better than others. And then when you were talking about seaweed getting washed up on the mm -hmm. coast, um, if you encounter that, should you throw it back in the ocean? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, at that point, by the time it's washed it's up over. onto the beach, it's, it's probably game over for it. And it might be fine. It might've already reproduced. And now it's going to be a detrital subsidy that will be eaten by beach critters. And that's super important, including insects all the way up, but it's, it's probably too late. Uh, okay. Too late. Yeah, just leave too it late. Be. Yeah. Just leave it be. Okay. And we're having just a barrage of questions. This is amazing. People are really connecting dots on things you talked about. So awesome. here is one. First of all, remind us the type of seaweed that nori is. Ah, that is the genus Pyropia or Porphyra. Uh, sometimes it's common, other common name besides nori is lava. It's a red okay. seaweed. I have some right here to show people. Excellent. Um, and then you mentioned seaweed can be a source of iodine. Mm -hmm. Can eating too much nori affect your thyroid? Maureen has asked. Ooh, that's a good question. And while I'm like almost that kind of doctor, I'm not quite that kind of it doctor. Would probably um, have to be a lot. I think it would have to be a consult lot. Consult your own healthcare. Yes. Ask, ask your healthcare care professional. I would say no, but I think, you know, anything is possible. And that's another thing that I always like to point out especially one of my other passions is uh, mushrooms. I like looking at mushrooms oh. and taking pictures of mushrooms. So they look really tall. Uh, and I took a couple of mycology classes when I was in college. And just because someone can eat something and it doesn't make them sick, doesn't mean every person will be affected the same way. And so uh, just something to keep in mind, like, you know, maybe to, you would have to, maybe different people have different tolerances for things in seaweed. So I guess proceed, proceed curiously, but with caution. Always do your own research or, you know, don't eat, don't put anything in your mouth. You're not a hundred percent sure that it's edible. Yes, exactly. And we, we had some people in the chat comparing the stipe of Ooh, uh -huh. a seaweed to the stipe of a mushroom. I guess yeah. kind of stem like structure is the same. And if That's the true. structures are similar, do you think there's a similar function between ah, those things? So that is a great observation. Um, again, so fungus are their own thing. Again, neither plants or animals, kind of like seaweeds. Mm -hmm. And they have a lot more, basically every fungus is just a lot of transportation tubes packed together. And so, mushrooms are a lot better at transporting substances like nutrients and water around their bodies. Yeah. Seaweeds, most of them do not do that. They have yeah. these stemish structures, but they're really just to keep the blades closer to the surface for photosynthesis or give, mm -hmm. give something, something to attach to. They're really not for transport except so then, in kelps. Oh. Kelps can move sugars that they okay. made in their blades down to different parts of their body. They have these super cool cellular structures called trumpet hyphae because of their shape. And hyphae, hyphae is another word that is kind of stolen from the realm of the fungus, but yeah. they're, they're doing similar things in that one particular instance, but they're still not evolutionarily similar. They're just kind of similar in yeah. function, but not in origin. It's interesting how these different fields of study will borrow terminology from each other just because there's not another way to describe these things. Exactly. Um, we had 
on my college walk with Aaron Tupac Ooh. about a month ago. Oh, that's fun. And they were talking about how mushrooms are referred to as fruiting bodies, but mm-hmm. not a fruit. Not a fruit. We're just calling it that because that's something we know, but I really like your idea of coming up with new common names for things. <laughs> I have a, have a pretty good pretty good list to, by now. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of native plants have really bad common names too because they're oh, all yeah. just like tar weed, telegraph weed, milk weed, and it's like these aren't weeds. Mm-hmm. They just, you know, they belong here. Or to be fair, uh, someone gave them a, a genus or species name with Clark in it. So yes, um. absolutely. <laughs> Gotta go back and change some of those names. Um, Okay, so JP had a really cool question or, you know, not even a question, but kind of a conversation starter about how there are urchin barons. Yes. The giant kelp off the California coast. That's true. But she is saying otters work symbiotically with them. That Monterey. is a really cool story. Yeah. Okay. You already uh, know. I don't even need to finish reading. <laughs> but the yeah. urchins no longer have natural predators. Is this well, true? That's kind of the problem. It's been it's been a big issue, especially in Northern California, where bull kelp beds have been disappearing. And one of the reasons is because of this overpopulation of urchins that's happened in like roughly the last 10 years, is what's the recent story is, but Historically, it goes back to the sea otters because sea otters are very hungry. They have to stay warm in very warm water. They have this thick fur, but they also have to eat a lot. And so what do sea otters like to eat? They like to eat sea urchins. So in places where there's lots of sea otters eating the sea urchins, the kelp, giant kelp, bull kelp, whatever can flourish because it's kind of one of those enemy of my enemy is my friend situations where the otters don't really have much of a relate. They don't have a feeding relationship with the kelp. They don't eat it. They might hang on to it sometimes, um, but they're still helping the kelp because they're eating the thing that wants to eat the kelp. Uh, but in a lot of areas of their range, sea otters were hunted to pretty much extinction because uh, that fuzzy fur that keeps them really warm and cozy also turned out to be something that was uh, real good in the fur trade and you could sell it for lots and lots of money. So they were hunted, that meant more urchins, less kelp. And that was a big problem for the kelp because urchins are really good at eating. They will mow down Mm. kelp and then you're left with coral and algae on the rocks. And then if they get hungry enough, they'll eat that. And then because urchins just don't quit, uh, they can hang out for years to possibly decades without eating because they'll reabsorb their own like gonads and just just keep going they're called zombie urchins where they're just kind of a hollow test with not a lot inside because they reabsorbed it to stay alive so we saw that historically um, in places where sea otters were lost and then we've seen a similar situation in recent years due to sea star wasting disease where there was a starting in about 2013, there was a huge die off of predatory sea stars. And I know people often don't think of predatory sea stars, what, but they eat a lot of urchins. And so without these sea stars, the urchins grew in population numbers, started mowing down the kelp. That's bad when you're a giant kelp. It's really bad when you're a bull kelp because you have to do this whole life cycle every year. And if you get mowed down by urchins, you, you don't really get to do that. And so That led to huge losses in kelp beds, which completely changes the ecosystem because then you've lost all the really good interactions of places to live, primary production, et cetera. Wow. So we should eat sea urchins then. Oh, yeah. Because there's too many of them. That is wonderful because I love seafood and so much of it is unsustainable. Yes. Things that are caught with big nets or deep ocean trawling. Mm, This is why I I always feel like it's kind of a splurge or like an indulgence, but sea urchin, we should just be gobbling them up and seaweed, right? Yeah, totally. There's lots of it. There is. That is phenomenal news. You guys, sea urchin is back on the menu. People even take the zombie urchins out and raise them in sea farms to like fatten them up because what people really want from urchins is the uni or the gonads. Mm. And so if you feed them and don't let them eat the kelp, then people can eat them. 
Oh my gosh. Um, someone in the chat wants to know if you have any seaweed jokes. Oh gosh. <laughs> um, if you need a second to think, I so can one of my friends who is yeah. a fellow, okay, fellow you psychologist. <laughs> I have to see if I can get all the parts of it because she tells okay. it like all the time. And every time I'm just like, oh, why? We can come back to it. I will mention on the topic of sea urchin, there's a spot in Koreatown called Crab House that specializes in raw crab and sea urchin. That's like the two main things they have. It's so good, you guys. Um, um, I think like someone in bowl. the chat might have a joke because it says, okay. what does algae do in an emergency? I don't know what. Thanks for saving me. Oh, <laughs> it calls that was good. for kelp. <laughs> that was good. I think that's more that's more palatable than mine. Mine had Thank some like you. it went too deep into the psychological land. So that's okay. great. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> you saved the day. It calls for kelp. That is wonderful. Um, I'm gonna use that. My new algae joke. Well, Andrew has a lot of good jokes. So. 701 so I think that was perfect timing um this is going to be recorded it'll be up on YouTube after this it's just going to take a few minutes to process it'll be up there later tonight thank you Dr. Katie Dobkowski for this amazing wonderful fun charming presentation uh everyone in the chat had wonderful feedback if you're watching via Zoom, you can check this out on YouTube. I'll send out the link to everyone that was registered. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to our channel. Like this video if you want to see more like it and turn on notifications to stay up to date. Uh, Katie, do you have any like social media that you want to plug for people to follow or any? You know, there is a, I, I'm a little bit of a social media Luddite, but there is a California seaweeds page on Facebook that I've started following. And sometimes people post things that they need identified on there. And I think that's super fun because uh, I love, I love looking at random pictures of seaweeds. So. Yes. Okay. Just like, just like us crazy plant people. Yep, exactly. But okay. yeah, thank you so much for having me. This was really fun. Thank you. And I think if, there's not already a drag queen named Egregia with a seaweed boa. That really needs to happen. <laughs> I think that is an upper, that is low hanging, low hanging zoospores right there. Oh, <laughs> that was almost Thanks a joke. So I want that. Noted. It, Thank you. you know, there's a lot of puns. There's puns count. Oh yeah. Okay, good. Thank All right. You. Well, you guys, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you for the next poppy hour in January. And thanks, Katie. Have a good night, everybody. We are going to end the stream now. Ta-ta, farewell.